thanks a lot, Matthias, for introduction. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to you and your colleagues for invitation. So indeed, I'm going to speak today about uh, magnet optics of topological materials. But let me put myself first in, uh, let's say, the context. So I'm working in a high magnetic field laboratory in Grenoble, which is uh, a large scale, uh, uh, pardon, which is a large scale research facility, which belongs to CNRS. It's located uh, here in the so-called Polygon Scientific, not uh, in Grenoble, not uh, not far away from other well-known uh, research centers like ESRF <coughs> or ILL. And the mission of our laboratory is to produce uh, in Grenoble, it is a DC magnetic field as high as possible and to use it for fundamental and applied research uh, in solid state physics, but not only in solid state physics. And our laboratory is also a member of uh, so-called European Magnetic Field Laboratory. So we are a member of a consortium which has four members. There are two DC laboratories in Nijmegen and in Grenoble, and then two pulse laboratories in Dresden and in Toulouse. And what is my uh, kind of mission in the lab in Grenoble? Actually, what I'm doing, I'm doing uh, magnetospectroscopy at low energies in the infrared and terahertz range. And we are uh, trying to use this uh, type of spectroscopy to look at the low energy excitations in various solids. So historically, we were working on semiconductors and semimetals. More recently, moved towards topological materials, but also to, towards superconductors, multiferroics, or antiferromagnets. Uh, and uh, today, I'm, I have chosen that I will basically speak about our research activities in the field of topological topological matter. And uh, I I think I should repeat what Matthias already mentioned that uh, there were many talks already during the two days of the workshop dedicated to various, let's say, applied aspects of use of magnetic fields in different systems. So in our case, uh, we can hardly pretend that we do anything applied uh, at the fields up to 37 Tesla in Grenoble. So what we do, we are simply playing with new interesting materials with which have uh, fancy, unusual band structures. We are trying to learn using magneto optics as much as, as possible about these materials and also study related, related phenomena which, uh, which appear in these systems. So, topological materials. So this is a topic which, uh, in which we are alway, always involved for, let's say, uh, last 10 or maybe even last 15 years. So uh, this is the topic uh, in which we have a number of collabora uh, collaborators. So uh, let me start with just uh, acknowledging their contribution. So we have a large number of collaborators which, on which we are collab collaborating with respect to the optical response of solids. Of course, we are happy to have uh, important theoretical support from different groups, especially, especially in France. Uh, and then also we need access to, uh, to techniques which are allowing us to characterize the samples like X-ray or, or transport. And importantly, we have to have a good relationship and we, have to, uh, do, uh, we do have a good relationship with, with, uh, with growers which are providing us with nice samples. My talk today will follow actually a pretty simple outline. I have decided that I will just try, uh, try to make a brief introduction into a Landau level spectroscopy, which is the main technique which we use uh, in our magnet optical measurements at low photon energies. And then I will give you a couple of examples, uh, some older examples <coughs> as a demonstration of kind of characteristic behavior. Um, but I will speak also about some uh, more recent results on Dirac nodal line semi-metals and also on, on topological insulators. So let me start my talk by, uh, by uh, really basics, so by something what every one of, of you know by heart, but anyway. So let me remind you what actually happens uh, when you take a, a charged particle, which is in a parabolic band. It means that it has a well-defined uh, effective mass. We know that uh, what happens is given by the equation of motion. And actually, if you solve the, uh, this equation of motion, you realize that such a particle, when the magnetic field is applied, undergoes so-called cyclotron motion. We know by heart that for, for such a massive particle, the frequency, the associated frequency looks like this, so-called cyclotron frequency. It is linear in magnetic field and depends on one material parameter. And when you have such a system in a magnetic field with electrons or holes undergoing cyclotron motion, you can come up with a radiation. And when the frequency of cyclotron motion matches the frequency of your radiation, you can get a resonant absorption 
you can get so-called wet cyclotron cycle resonance. And this is uh, the phenomenon and uh, uh, and uh, associated experimental technique, which uh, has a long, uh, actually a long history in the solid state physics. Actually, the first cyclotron resonance experiments were done already in the 50s with the group of, uh, of Dresselhaus. And those, those times they were looking at uh, a germanium and they observed really for the first time cyclone resonance in solids. But those times it was not that they just used this technique to read out uh, what is the effective mass of electrons or the holes in germanium. But actually it was more interesting. Uh, it, was, it was so that in the 50s, basically the, all this concept of quasi particles in solids were not really well established. So basically doing cyclone resonance and, uh, resonance and observing uh, particles which have mass very much different from a free electron mass. This was the way how the whole concept of quasi particles was established in in fifties. Okay, so we have cyclone cyclone resonance, but of course, what I was saying up to now is uh, let's say this basic, uh, I would say high school uh, high school level of description of cyclone resonance. One should do it uh, more properly. So he lead, uh, leave this classical regime and we go to, uh, to high magnetic fields or better, uh, better specimens, which have a longer, uh, longer relaxation time. We definitely move to the situation when we do no longer have a continuous band structure, but we transform it by applying magnetic field into Landau levels. Um, but uh, what is important to be said is that if you are kind of interested in optical response of such a Landau, Landau, quantized, Landau quantized systems, if you look at the system in which you have uh, massive particles, it means that you have a parabolic band and you go to the quantum regime that you may be disappointed that actually with the selection rules as they are, the optical response actually looks like exactly as in the classical regime. The only LO transitions which you can have are among, uh, among adjacent pairs of adjacent Landau levels. So what it means that uh, finally at the end of the day, you do not get anything more than, uh, than the classically defined cyclotron, cyclotron frequency. So cyclotron resonance in this quantum regime is nothing else than just excitations of elect elect electrons between adjacent Landau levels. As I said, cyclotron resonance has a long history in, uh, in the physics, so I pick up some, some examples. So it was applied, I would say, to hundreds and maybe uh, thousands of materials, and it is extremely useful. One can, uh, one can deduce quite straightforwardly effective mass. There is only a one slight problem of cyclone resonance, and this is that actually if you work on conventional materials which have a parabolic bands, and there are plenty of them, especially semiconductors, then this is a pretty much boring experimental technique, because whatever you do, at the end of the day, you have just single, one single line in your, uh, in your experimental response, which is a linear in magnetic field, and the position simply depends on, on, the, on the effective mass which, uh, which the particle has. And even worse, if you would like to do some hydristic physics, just considering, for example, that you have actually a gas of electrons and they are interacting, and for example, you could do some many particle physics doing cyclone resonance, that even this is forbidden and there are quite well-defined theoretical reasons for this. So cyclone resonance, long history, important, important technique, but extremely boring technique in the end. And to have it a bit more interesting, actually what one can do is actually to leave this assumption that we are working on conventional materials, those which have well-defined parabolic bands, and look at different systems, and actually those systems will be topological systems. But let's stay still in the general, and let's move to another example how a cyclotron resonance uh, or cyclotron motion in general may look like. Let's move to a conical band. Because conical band, you may see as, uh, let's say, an extreme case of, uh, of a non-parabolism. So imagine that we have a conical band, and we have, again, a charged particle uh, in such a band. In this case, this charged particle has uh, effectively zero, or if you wish, infinite mass. Uh, and of course, one is not surprised that when we apply magnetic field, then also such, such a particle undergoes a cyclotron motion. This is again given by a simple equation of motion. But if we do the calculation, we finally find out that the associated cyclotron frequency is of course not the same as before, is different, is given by this pre prescription. 
So it is still linear in magnetic field, but here, where we before had the mass, the band mass, or, uh, or simply the curvature of this parabolic band, we have now something what is energy dependent. We have a quantity which is called cycloton mass. If you remember a bit from relativity, did you immediately see that actually our cycloton mass is nicely following this energy mass relation of, of, of Einstein. So we immediately see that simply moving from a conventional parabolic band to a conical band, our cyclone resonance becomes more complex, becomes energy dependent. So simply, uh, simply cyclotron frequency of particles is depending on what energy the particle has. This is not the case of, of particles in the parabolic band. To give some experimental example of this, uh, I think it's difficult to start uh, start differently than uh, to mention system which you know uh, very well, and it's graphene, because we know that in graphene we can have such a well-defined conical band, or even more of them. They are located at the corners of of the hexagonal brillant zone, uh, where the particles behave uh, like. Uh, to certain extent, massless relativistic uh, like particles, which are charged. So uh, it means that we have something like a charge, charge neutrinos. And if you take graphene and you do a cyclotron resonance, then you can get a result, for example, which, uh, which looks like this. So here I'm showing some older experiment of, of, of ours, basically more than 10 years old. So the situation is that we have graphene, quite large area graphene. So we have a conical band in graphene, which is uh, which has a Fermi level quite low in uh, in the valence band. So we have quite a hole density, high hole density. So we can take the system and look at how the cyclone resonance looks like. And in this classical regime, uh, cyclone resonance looks like this. So here we have uh, absorption as a function of energy and as a function of magnetic field in the far or let's say terahertz infrared range. And you see that the modes, mode which we observed in graphene is linear in magnetic field. But what is important is that the slope is in this case not given by some mass of the particle, but is given by the doping. And if you actually take graphene, which is differently doped, then the slope of this mode will, dif will be different. And this is something what you cannot have in a system with a, with a conventional parabolic bands. Then, if you look at this data a little bit closer, and you do not follow all this, uh, let's say, this big picture behavior, the single mode, you may realize that actually in this data you see uh, certain small steps in, in the response. And what it is, this is actually onset of a Landau level quantization. So you see that, that in contrast to the parabolic bands now, the, the Landau quantization has some effect. So let's have a look what happens when we take conical bands and we apply magnetic field high enough so that this conical band uh, is transformed from, let's say, a continuous density of states towards discrete Landau levels or quasi-discrete Landau levels. And to do so, uh, uh, let me uh, let me explain this on, on, on this cartoon. So if you have a conical band uh, and you apply magnetic field, then the prescription from Landau levels, Landau levels looks like this. This is, I think, already quite well-known formula these days, at least since the discovery of graphene. And the Landau levels, in uh, in uh, in a system with uh, with a conical band differ very much from those which we what we saw for a parabolic band. There we had just a simple set of uh, harmonic oscillator equidistant levels separated by the classical cyclotron frequency. Here we have a bit more complex behavior. Landau levels are no longer equidistant. Actually, they have this nice square root of integer scaling, and also Landau levels are no longer linear in magnetic field. And if you consider what are the standard selection rules for optical transition, I mean electric dipole transitions in such a system, you may find out what is the expected, theoretically expected optical response. So here we have a cartoon. So we have Landau levels, which follow this nice square root of B de dependence, which is so much typical of massless particles or in general uh, of conical bands. Here we have Landau levels at a certain fixed magnetic field, and the vertical arrows are, point, are denoting some of, of, uh, of the LO transitions following this particle selection rule, telling us that, uh, that uh, the index of a Landau level should change by one uh, with an electron dipole, dipole transition. And here on the right hand side, I, I plotted theoretically expected real part of optical conductivity which means basically absorption coefficient for two different positions of Fermi levels. 
And you see that the response is quite complex. Actually, at low energies, we have uh, we have response of let's say three particles. So this is our cyclotron resonance, and we may have not only one but even more modes because our lambda levels are not equidistant. And then at higher energies, but basically still in the same energy range, energy uh, energy region, we have a series of transitions which are connected lambda levels between uh, between valence band and conduction band. So finally, we we have a magnet optical response it, which is considerably more complex and from this viewpoint also interesting as compared to cyclotron resonance in a simple parabolic uh, parabolic parabolic band so we have a series of excitations and actually each of these excitations has a certain intensity position field dependence and uh, and based of this and also broadening and based of this we can learn a lot about about material which we study Again, to illustrate this, I dig out some pretty old data of ours taken on graphene. I'm seeing that this is already 15 years we measured this. But anyway, I think this is a good illustration how uh, an optical response of a conical band may look like. So this was measured on nearly under graphene, which can be driven into a quantum regime with a well-resolved Landau levels at quite low magnetic fields. And here in this inset, you see a characteristic transmission, transmission spectrum of graphene, low dope graphene. So you have a cyclotron resonance absorption line at low energies, and that at high energies, you have a series of interband interland level excitations. So as I said, we have a multi-mode multi -mode response. Uh, then all these lines nicely follow a square root of B dependence, as you can see from uh, from uh, from this false color map, uh, false color map, which is plotted as a function of energy and the square root of magnetic field. So all our square root of B transitions are now linear in magnetic in square root of B magnetic field. And having such a response, we can proceed and actually say what everything we can learn about this particular graphene just by doing this experiment. So definitely the first thing which we can learn is the velocity parameter. It is actually the slope of the conical band, which is defining the position of all these transitions. But if you go farther, you can uh, you can say much more. From the broadening of lines, you can say what is the scattering time or even mobility, even as a function of energy, because we have a, a multimode response. You can go to low energies. You can learn actually what is the carrier density from just from the response. Again, this is impossible in a system which has a parabolic band where you have always the same response independently uh, independently of a number of carriers, just the intensity of the absorption scales. Uh, or you can also look at the limit of low magnetic fields and you can, for example, say whether there is or there is no deviation was from a square root of B. So if there is or there is no gap in the system. Okay. So now we know everything about about graphene, about magnet optics of graphene in the classical and in in the quantum regime. And now with this, let me move towards topological materials. Finally, so we know that uh, in solid state physics, uh, topological materials nowadays uh, form a big group of uh, of different systems. It finally appears that basically a kind of good fraction of all solids which we nowadays know. Uh, are basically a topological materials, but officially a topological material appeared uh, in the physics in 2007, together with the with the discovery of the first topological insulator. But the f but later on, pretty fast, this topological field expanded to towards a very much different system, and actually this expansion continues, uh, still continues, and we are still new classes and sub subclasses of topological materials. The question is, of course, why I was speaking about uh, about uh, about graphene before approaching topological materials, and the reason for this is that, of course, if you want to understand how the band structure of all these systems, and of course I'm not listing all of them, are looking like, then you have to use uh, certainly topological band theory, and then to pronounce kind of all this fancy fancy wording and important wording which theorists are using all these topological invariants and Chern numbers and topological charges. And all this is very much important and very much true. At the same time, if you are experimentalist as I am, then one can have a look at the topologi topological materials in a little bit different way, in a very much simplified way. And one may simply say that actually for almost all topological materials, actually one thing is true, 
that if you go through the complex band structure of these systems, you finally find there somewhere in this complex band structure some relativistic like electrons, massless electrons, I mean, which are in conical bands, which are located somewhere in, in the band structure of these materials, somewhere in the brilliant zone. And of course, these conical bands can be very much different. They can differ by dimensionality. They, they may uh, be spin degenerated, but don't have to be. They may, but don't have to be very degenerated. These conical bands may and don't have to be protected by kind of symmetry, but the simplified view is valid. Topological materials are usually a systems, let's say 95% of them are systems in which you find a nicely defined conical bands. Some time ago, I prepared this kind of table to emphasize what I just said, just to compare uh, what kind of uh, systems with topological bands, uh, to conical bands, uh, but also topological bands we have. So uh, you may see that we have systems in, in which you can have a one-dimensional conical band, two-dimensional, three-dimensional conical, three-dimensional conical band. They may be spin degenerated. They may be very, very degenerated. They can uh, keep a degeneracy of both, or they can lack any kind of de degeneracy. And I think this table I prepared a long time ago, something like 10 years ago, and nowadays this table would be filled with hundreds and thousands of, 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 of materials. Okay, so we know that topological materials have conical bands uh, as uh, similar to graphene. So let's have a look now at some examples, experimental examples, particular materi materials and optical response actually, to see how much uh, this resembles graphene, this optical response, actually how much we can understand from optical response, magneto-optical response of topological materials based on what we already know from, from graphene. And the first material I have chosen is, uh, is, uh, is a nice system which uh, was actually quite old in the, uh, in the solid state physics. It first appeared in the 70s, but only in 2014 people realized that actually Cadmium arsenide, and this is the system I speak about, is so-called three-dimensional Dirac semi-metal. And this is a material which you may view as a three-dimensional analog of graphene. We know that graphene is two-dimensional and has a conical bands, uh, which are spin degenerated. In this case, cadmium arsenide is a system in which you may find two conical bands, which are three-dimensional, uh, oriented uh, along, along the tetragonal axis of this material. And uh, both these cones are spin been degenerated. And if you know this, you may already expect how the magneto-optical response may you, you look like. So if you do, for example, high field magneto-reflectivity experiments, here in this early stage of this material, we tried to do uh, really high field experiments and follow the, follow the reflectivity up to, up to 33 Tesla. Then if you pick up positions of certain modes which you observe, then you immediately see that all these modes nicely follow the square root of the dependence. So indeed, we have some massless particles inside. Square, as I said, square root of B behavior is a hallmark of massless particles in solids. So this was the first example, a system which is uh, concerning optical response graphene-like, but of course it has nothing to do with graphene. This is just a specific, a specific topological material. Another material which I would like to mention is a system which is pretty much old in the solid state physics. It is uh, mercury cadmium telluride. This is a semi-metal semiconductor de depending on the composition, the ratio between mercury and cadmium, which uh, was heavily studied since 60s. And actually, if you properly tune the composition of the material, and properly tuning means that you put there just 17% of cadmium, and uh, and the rest of uh, of mercury, and you put the material at uh, at uh, at low temperatures, then the band structure looks like this. This is actually point at uh, a point at which this material is exactly at the topological phase transition, and the band structure is pretty much interesting. In this case, we have one single three-dimensional conical band, which is sitting in the center of the brilliant zone. And there is one in the semiconductor language uh, uh, called, uh, called heavy hole band crossing the apex of this three-dimensional three -dimensional conical band. So again, we get system which is pretty much similar to graphene, but in three dimensions. And look it, looking at uh, magneto-optic response, you see that again, uh, we have response which pretty much resembles graphene. Again, 
a number of transitions, in this case, mostly interband transitions from the valence to the conduction band as a function, function of square root of B gives a nice linear, linear behavior. And another example, which I would like to show just to present, uh, present topological materials is this one. This is uh, zirconium pentatelluride uh, system, which appeared in, in, in topological business something like 10 years ago. In this case, this is a system in which we have a single three-dimensional conical, uh, conical band sitting at the gamma point in the center of the valence zone. And again, you see the re reflectivity response, uh, nice almost square root of B behavior. The only difference as compared to what we know from graphene is that in this case, if you look at your extrapolation down to low energies, you may actually deduce that there is a small gap in this material. So uh, the conical band in the system is not perfect. There is a small gap at the level of five mil electron volts. And actually this was the, the target of, of our recent studies when we try to follow this gap as a, as a, as a temperature and we try to decide whether the system is a weak or, uh, or strong topological insulator following quite, uh, quite intensive discussions in, in, in the community. So those are, let's say, a bit all the results which I wanted to show as, uh, as an illustration uh, how a magneto-optic response of topological material may, lo may look like. And now I would like to move to two more recent examples and I would like to start first with, a, our, with our recent magneto-optical study of a three-dimensional topological insulator, which has a little bit uh, complex composition. It's based on uh, bismuth, antimon, tellur, and sulfur. And moreover, it's domed, uh, domed by, uh, by, uh, by tin. Why this material? For this, I think I should just briefly, briefly remind you what is a topological insulator. Maybe not all of you are involved in this business. So topological insulator is, is a special topological insulators. Three dimension topological insulators are materials uh, which are forming a special class within the wall topological matter. Those are basically narrow gap semiconductors. So systems which have a quite well defined band gap. But <clears throat> thanks to specific symmetries in the system and uh, thanks to order, order of bands, so called inverted ordering of, of bands in, in topological insulators, uh, they are hosting very specific surface states. So in the bulk, uh, you, have, you have a gap, but on the surface, you have a surface states which have a form of a nice conical band. Again, we have a topological material. So again, we have somewhere in the band structure, this time, this time on the surface, surface, we have a conical band. And the material which I'm showing here with this complex name has one special property because uh, it quite resembles other quite well-known topological insulators like bismuth selenide, bismuth telluride, which are really fairly well-known materials. But these systems are usually suffering uh, by, a simple, by a simple fact that even though concerning band structure, they can be classified as a topological insulators, then if you look at the real crystals, usually they have pretty high uh, high non-intrinsic uh, intrinsic doping due to due to defects. So very rarely you can get these materials really insulating, and this is quite important to have them insulating because only when when these materials are insulating, you can reasonably well access these interesting surface states in the form of a conical band. And just this thin doped uh, bismuth antimon dithylurized sulfur is a material which behaves as almost ideal three-dimensional topolog topological insulator. This thin doping ensures that you have almost zero bulk uh, electron density, but still uh, the quality, electronic quality of the material is high. So here are just, uh, just uh, measurements from zero field optical response, just to show you that if you look at the real part of optical conductivity, which is basically the absorption in, uh, in the system that at low energies, you, the abs uh, this conductivity is basically, basically vanishing. And this means that there are no, uh, no bulk, uh, no bulk uh, electrons or holes in, in these materials. So the true absorption is, is completely negl negligible. So let's move uh, and let's have a look at how a magnet optic response of such a material may look like. So here I am plotting some some selected spectra of relative magnetotransmission. So you simply 
look at uh, look at how much light is passing through a thin sheet of such a topological insulator and you compare it uh, uh, with respect uh, with respect to zero magnetic field so you basically make a ratio of, uh, of the transmission at at a given magnetic field to uh, zero magnet uh, to, uh, to the to the transmission at zero magnetic field and you see that definitely there is something happening so uh, so there is some response but to understand this response it's much better to plot such uh, such a transmission data in the form of color color plots and if you look at the color plots you may find out that actually what we observe in this topological insulator uh, are basically two modes at low energies we have one mode which goes relative kind of linearly with magnetic field so we may assign this mode to residual electrons in topological insulators so possibly still there are some bulk electrons in the system but there are very few of them but more interestingly there is another mode which actually follows quite well a square root of b dependence which is as i said a nice hallmark of massless particles and actually this uh, this mode really comes from the sur surface from this conical band on, on the surface and one may identify uh, this this mode as a transition between zero and the first landau level in this uh, in this non 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 equidistantly spaced set of landau levels typical of massless particles and then of course just reading out the position of our mode we can deduce for example the the velocity parameter uh, so we see that we have a response of the surface state. On the other hand, um, uh, there were, of course, the preceding studies of topological insulators and such a behavior was observed already before. So for so far, nothing so much new. But the new thing starts actually when you look at the response of this material as a function of temperature. And this is what we did recently. And I was quite amazed that what you can actually get is that if you increase the temperature and you follow the response that basically you can get get a cyclotron resonance in a solid state system in a topological insulator basically basically up to room temperature and when i was uh, saying in the beginning that uh, we are just playing with materials and we are aiming at nothing really applied in our research then maybe uh, this kind of finding that we can have a cyclotron resonance in the topological insulator at room temperature is probably the closest thing where where i can approach uh, approach uh, approach anything applied so perhaps all these speculations about topological materials to be to be used as a nice uh, in some some nice magnet optical devices at room temp temperature maybe this is this is not really a speculation. Maybe this can can be a reality in the future. Let me now move to uh, to another system I would like to speak about. So again, another class of of materials from uh, from the topological family, and this time this is so uh, those are materials or one particular material which belongs to the class of so-called Dirac node line semimetals. What are these systems? So in the first approach, you can simply see the band structure in such a materials as a band structure of graphene, uh, but in a three dimensional solid. It means that we have a conical band like in graphene in such a three dimensional, uh, three -dimensional crystal, but the conduction band and the valence band are not really meeting in a single point like in graphene, in the two dimensional graphene, but actually they are meeting on a line and such a system do exist or almost exist in solid state physics and such a system with such a line are called Dirac node line semimetals. And one of them is barium nickel disulfide, a system on which we spend some time and which uh, is probably one of very simple examples of node line, node line semimetals. Uh, if you look at the band structure, these node line semimetals are oriented along a tetragonal axis of this material and they can be also calculated in DFT. Those are these, these, these crossing points which you may trace how they evolve, as basically a line which evolved through, through the Brillouin band. So how one can see that in such a material uh, there is really a Dirac node line. Okay, how well, one can see that this band, st band structure is really present there experimentally. And actually the first indication which you can have is uh, even when you do optics at zero magnetic field, and you may observe that if you look at real part of optical conductivity, I remind you that this is the part which is basically defining uh, dissipative processing in the system. So you may see it as, a, as a, simply a absorption coefficient. 
Then in barium nickel disulfide, this uh, interband absorption is basically pretty flat. And also when in other node line semimetals like zirconium silicon sulfide, this response is pretty, pretty much flat. And if you remember a little bit from the optics of graphene, this is something what people studied uh, 15 years ago and when they realized that if you look at the optical response of graphene due to interband excitations, I mean those which are promoting electrons from the valence to the conduction band, that if you look at the optical absorption due to such a processes, then this trans uh, that absorption, this dispersion list is completely flat. And this is a simple effect of uh, density of states. Simply if you take a joint density of states or simply density of states in, in a system with a conical band, then you may directly calculate what is absorption of absorption coefficient in the system. And the simple formula tells you that it should be flat. Nothing more than a simple effect of density of states. And this is actually what we see in this direct node line semimetals. So this is actually really the first hint that we have systems which uh, which have a conical bands and which have even this this node line uh, at which this uh, this valence and conical band band meet. But of course, I'm more interested in the optical response in magnetic field. So you may simply take this system, apply magnetic field, of course, along the node line. And you may see whether the response is really graphene like and the answer is yes and no so if you look at reflectivity at the as a function of magnetic field and energy in such a system with the magnetic field applied along uh, along the node line you see that we get again a series of interband transitions something what very much resembles uh, resembles uh, resembles graphene uh, the difference is that if you look at the extrapolation of these lines in the limit of low magnetic fields, you find out that, that, that there is a small gap, like in zirconium, uh, zirconium pentadellurite. And in this case, uh, this gap is not, uh, not there by some disorder or, or by, some, uh, by, by some mistake. So this gap is simply well defined by the presence of a spin orbit interaction in, in this material. Okay. So. Those are a few words about uh, the Dirac node line semimetals. And before I move to another example from this particular family, let me spend a little bit of time uh, on introducing one particular concept in solid state physics. And this is the concept of a tilted conical band. So, so far I was speaking and uh, repeating and repeating that we have solids in which we may have a conical band. And I also mentioned a couple of times in my talk that in some cases such a conical bands can be simply gapped. So we have, uh, we have cones at the low energies, they have a parabolic, uh, pardon, pardon, the hyper, hyperbolic shape and there is a small gap open. So far so good. And what you can imagine, why not? And this is really something what happens in a certain solids that you simply take such such a cone and you you tilt it. In in uh, let's say a view of a Hamiltonian, this would mean that you describe uh, describe such a such a cone by Hamiltonian, and then you add there one linear ten, term in momentum, which means that you just add one velocity parameter to the system, and you get a cone which is tilted. If you are an experimentalist like me, then of course such a tilted cone is, um, uh, is uh, for me nothing else than an indirect gap semiconductor. When the, when the cone was not tilted, band structure looked like a, like a direct, direct gap semiconductor. When the band structure is tilted, uh, the gap becomes, becomes indirect. And actually as an experimentalist, I would be fine with this. But there are also theories around which actually uh, like to look at such a tilted conical band, which indeed appears in some, some systems, uh, so in some solid, solid, solid state systems. They like to say that actually we may see such a tilted conical band in a different view. And they like to say that actually such a tilted conical band is nothing else than a system of, uh, of massive Dirac electrons, which are in a moving frame so we have a system which is simply moving with a certain velocity. And when we accept this, that simply tilted conical band is, is a system in a moving reference frame in terms that the Hamiltonian looks like, then we may find out also that actually this indirect gap, which is a little bit reduced when you tilt the, the cone, 
is actually driven by Lorentz boost driven renormalization. So basically, from the theoretical viewpoint, what you have here is a piece of special relativity in solid state physics, which tells you that when you are tilting the cone, then your gap is driven by the standard Lorentz spectral of gamma, which, is, which has the standard definition, which you learn at, 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 at high school. So fine, so we have a theoretical concept, how to look at a tilted conical bands, a specific feature which appears in a certain solids, but, a, but the question is actually in which solids and how one can study, study this experimentally, how one can actually study this piece of relativity and kind of another analogy between solid state physics and high energy physics. There are already a couple of them like Cairo anomaly or Klein tunneling. So this kind of loaded boost driven renormalization of the spectrum is next analogy which one can build up between these two areas of, of, of physics. And with this long introduction, let me move finally to the particular experiment which we did recently on uh, Dirac node line semi-metal, which is a dis different one than I was showing before. In this case, this is niobium diarzenite, which uh, is again a system with a node line, Dirac node line, but just this uh, node line is a little bit different because it propagates through the brilliant zone. Actually, there are two node lines which are nicely propagating through the brilliant zone. They are open, so they go from one brilliant zone to the other brilliant zone. And these node lines are actually dispersive. So basically this node line, which are a little bit like, like a little bit gapped. So in reality, this is not really a node line, but this is how, what, how the terminology is set in the field. Then they are actually these node lines crossing the Fermi level twice. And actually this crossing in the part where the node line is dispersive is interesting because we may have a look at the bed structure in the vicinity of this crossing. And if you look at the band structure in the plane, which is perpendicular to this crossing, then what we have is basically fending, uh, fending band with a small band. This is nothing special, but uh, what is more interesting is that if we tilt our plane in some direction, we may find out that in this specific situation, we, when we look at the dis, this plane, how the dispersion of electrons in this plane, in this plane looks like, that it looks like a tilted conical band. And if you rotate your plane a bit more, then you can even go to the over tilted case. So simply Dira, uh, this Dirac node line system, niobium diarzenite, is exactly the material in which you can have a tilted conical band. And this is a nice system where you can study this by magneto optics because you simply take a crystal, you apply magnetic field. By applying magnetic field, you, decide, uh, you define the plane in which electrons or and holes are undergoing cycles of motion. And then you can probe the motion of electrons or holes, depending on the, on the situation, in, in the cone, which is standing or which is tilted or which is over tilted, just depending on the direction of the, uh, of the applied magnetic field, on the direction of applied magnetic field with respect to the node line which we have in the material. And actually, this is what, what we really did. So we took a crystal of niobium diarzenite and we did reflectivity experiment in the standard Faraday configuration in which uh, the momentum of light is aligned with, uh, with magnetic field. But we look at the different facets of these crystals. And thanks to this, we, we knew that our magnetic field is applied with a certain angle with respect to the node line direction. And without going into detail, I just would like to point out that as before, I was reading out the band gap in the system from a simple extrapolation of lines down to zero magnetic field, lines which are bringing electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. Then when you do this thing also in this material, you find out that if you take a, a different facet of this crystal, you simply get a band gap which differs. And this, that, this is something very much unusual usually from uh, from uh, from a standard magneto optical measurements people like to determine the band gap but in this case it doesn't work because simply the deduced value of the band gap the effective band gap which you get by this extrapolation simply depends on the facet on the orientation of the crystal with respect to the magnetic field 
And actually, if you make the analysis a bit deeper, you may find out that the band gap which you deduced in this way is really governed nicely by these Lorentz rules, which I introduced for the tilted conical band. So by a simple, quite straightforward magneto-optical experiment, you can have an, you can build up another analogy between between uh, let's say quantum relativistic uh, electrodynamics and and solid state physics. And that's basically all what I wanted to show today. So uh, I think the most important is this first conclusion uh, that uh, that simply magnet optics is a quite su suitable way at low energies, I mean, to explore topological materials, but are not only topological materials. And actually, there are plenty of things which one can uh, one can learn by doing these experiments about these materials. And so that's all. Thanks a lot for attention. Thank you, Milan. <clears throat> Thank you for this uh, exciting uh, overview of um, the whole zoology of uh, materials that you've been studying and, and especially the fact that we know we can do uh, special relativity um, at room temperature and uh, at rest <laughs> and without very high magnetic fields. Uh. Um, any uh, questions from the audience? No questions in the chat? So. I'll take uh, I'll take charge of this. I have a I have a bunch of questions actually. <laughs> okay, shoot. Uh, no, no, no. But uh, I'm, I'm, I was very uh, very fascinated by by everything that you showed. But, but maybe first of all, a very um, uh, um, stupid question. But um, this is really a, a an, 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 like I said, a zoology of materials that you're studying. I mean, where are you getting all these materials? Uh, you mean um, getting ideas or getting crystals? Yeah, well, b both of them. <laughs> okay, I think uh, I think uh, this becomes a kind of hobby of theorists to go through all possible, <laughs> possible and impossible materials and to apply DFT and try to find out what exotic band structure you may you may find. And then there are other groups of uh, of uh, researchers, the growers which are basically every day following the con map and they are looking at what is published and they are trying to grow it. Yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, so, this is I mean, you are always talking about uh, the material and then, but I suppose that it must be quite a challenge to get, uh, first of all, a, a good crystalline quality. I mean, probably there's a huge bunch of work going on first to get the material in its proper conditions to observe all these effects or... Uh, my I think I think the answer is that of course there are plenty of interesting materials which are in, uh, interesting only from the theoretical viewpoint and never gave any interesting magnet optics in experiments and I'm not speaking about them because they gave nothing so of course I am giving you a positive positive selection of things which uh, which are giving something interesting that's it. So yeah. long list, the long list of materials which are predicted to have a particular band structure, to have a specific properties, uh, and in principle interesting for magneto optics, but yeah. they give nothing from different reasons. Sometimes the DFT is simply wrong. Yeah. This happens because these materials are usually gapless, and whenever you have something gapless, then you are at very small energy scales, and the DFT sometimes is very weak in this case. And the, in the other option is that simply the crystalline quality is not good enough. Okay. And then I have um, an, an, another question more from an instrumental side, uh, because you showed man, uh, wonderful results. Uh, probably you didn't have the time to talk a little bit about the, the technique itself, uh, because I've seen rather wide spectra that you've been showing going from all the way down to the terahertz up to sometimes even the near infrared. Okay. Uh, you are not measuring, I'm, I suppose that you're not measuring this all in one, one go. So uh, can, you, can you comment a little bit on uh, okay. what fact, kind of uh, spectroscopy techniques that you're using uh, to do these uh, measurements? Okay, I don't like to speak much about spectroscopy because if I say that we are using a boring Fourier transfer spectroscopy, <laughs> okay. then you can be disappointed, okay? So, uh, the point is that if you do experiments in high fields like we did, not always, but often, uh, then you have to have a technique which is robust enough. 
Yeah. And Fourier transform spectroscopy is such a technique. It's extremely robust. You don't have to spend a long time by aligning. You can simply take your spectrometer, push it on the wheels across the laboratory, install it for a week or two with high field magnets and work and come back. So basically, I think standard Fourier transform spectroscopy is, uh, yeah, this is a very often tool in, in chemistry and solid state physics. So uh, there are standard spectrometers. They are broad range working from the terahertz range, basically up to visible range. So just following some standard technical requirements like uh, detectors, beam splitters, and so on, you can really use them in a broad range of energies, basically by free order of magnitude uh, of, uh, of photon frequency, quite straightforwardly. So what I last thing I would like to ask was um, what you've been showing is um, uh, mainly um, uh, magneto absorption spectroscopy on the diagonal part of the conductivity. Mm -hmm. uh, many interesting things there, but did, do you also do the uh, spectra of the hull, conduct hull conductivity or is yes, that not definitely. something that is included in your setups? Yeah, definitely. Uh, care rotation and especially Faraday rotation. Faraday rotation is better for us uh, from, let's say, practical reasons. Yes, we, we are looking at this and uh, yes, this is this is what we can do and this is what we do regularly yeah yeah but you didn't show, uh, yeah, any, didn't show any any results on that so uh, the, 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 oh, just no, a no. small disappointment from my side but, but uh, <laughs> understandably we can discuss this later but uh, i'm there's is it am i naive in saying that the main characteristics that what you're observing on the on, on from a dispersion kind of view what you're observing on the Diagonal terms of the conductivity also pop up again on the on the off diagonal terms, or is there a? Uh, I think there are. I think, of course, definitely diagonal and of the of diagonal terms are closely connected, but there are some specific effects which are only due to off the off diagonal terms. So, for example, what we would like to try, and this is what I'm really curious, there are quite solid theoretical predictions, which are verified only at low temperatures, that if you take a topological insulator, like in this, this complex guy I was studying uh, studying and showing today, this is the left, left bottom figure, uh, then if you look at the Faraday rotation on such a surface state of topological insulator, the Faraday angle should be actually universal. Universal in the sense that, uh, that the angle is given just by the phase structure constant. Something okay. like this you cannot get in the diagonal term. You can get it thanks to the off-diagonal terms. You can get it in the Faraday rotation experiment. And this is actually the plan what we, what we, we would like to do, uh, do now. When we know that we can have cyclone resonance at room temperature, Mm -hmm. then probably one can have a universal Faraday rotation at room temperature. And this is something what would be pretty interesting. Okay. Let me know when you get there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you say room temperature, but I suppose 16 Tesla or something like that. Or mm, Yes, but take it so that all these conical bands uh, have a square root of B dependence. It means that you do not need much of the field that, you, uh, that your mode shoots up uh, in the energy. Okay, so this is this is another thing which I didn't emphasize enough that actually sometimes high fields are not really needed. If you have a conical band, then yeah. the square root of B is extremely sensitive. So if your Fermi level is close to the to the uh, Dirac point, to the crossing points of the bands, sometimes uh, one micro Tesla is enough to open a gap or get Landau levels. <laughs> 